Welcome back everyone. Today we are tackling a topic that I know a lot of you have been asking about, especially those of you with dogs dealing with osteoarthritis. Yeah, it's a big one for sure. We're diving deep into a really important new research paper hot off the presses. It's titled, Get This, Musculoskeletal Adverse Events in Dogs Receiving Bed in Vet Mab, Liberla, and given how widely liberal it is used out there, and honestly, the generally positive experiences that a lot of people have shared, it's really important to understand, um, I guess, all of the nuances, all of the sides of the story that this new research is highlighting. Absolutely. This isn't just some anecdotal stuff. And yeah. we're talking about a serious research paper here. And it's taken a really deep dive into the data from the European Medicines Agency's, uh, what's it called, the Uter Vigilance Database. Yeah, the Uter Vigilance Database. Right. And that database covers like a huge time span. They looked at data going all the way back from 2004 to 2024. What? Yeah. And on top of that, they went and did a super in-depth review of 19 specific cases where dogs unfortunately experienced some adverse events after being treated with, well, you guessed it, the Dinvet Mab, better known to most people as Libula. Liberla, yeah. Yeah. So basically, the goal of this deep dive is to break down this research paper, try to figure out what it all means for the safety profile of Luprilla, what are the key takeaways you should be aware of, you know, as someone who's got a dog who loves their dog and wants to make the best choices for their health. Yes, for sure. We'll be digging into the nitty gritty. We'll look at the study's methods, maybe some surprising results, and of course, the conclusions of the expert panel that was involved in this research. And as always, we're going to try our best to deliver this information in a clear, digestible way. We don't want to bog anyone down with too much technical jargon. Exactly. All right. So let's start with the basics for anyone who might be unfamiliar. Can you give us a quick rundown of what exactly Bidden Vet Mab or Liberla is and how it works? Sure. So Liberla or Bidden Vet Mab, it's kind of a new kid on the block, relatively speaking. It's a monoclonal antibody. Okay. And it targets something called nerve growth factor or NGF to manage pain in dogs with osteoarthritis. So it's specifically designed to help those dogs who are struggling with those, you know, painful joints. Exactly. So it got the green light from the European Commission back in November 2020 and later got FDA approval too. Oh. And it's also sold as Baransa in Australia. Oh, interesting. Different name, same drug. So was this a big deal when it first came out? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was a huge development. It was actually the first treatment of its kind specifically for canine osteoarthritis pain. Mm -hmm. Now think about all those dogs out there suffering from OA. Yeah, it's a pretty common problem. It is. And for a long time, the options were limited, especially when they came to balancing effectiveness with safety. So Libra came onto the scene with all these promises of improved safety and better pain control compared to the traditional NSAIDs, those non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that have been the mainstay for so long. So there was definitely a lot of optimism surrounding Liberla. Yeah, there was. I mean, vets were excited about it. Mm -hmm. Pet owners were excited about it. It seemed like a potential game changer. But as we often see with new medications, and especially those that work in completely new ways, some concerns have started to crop up. Oh, concerns. Right. And this is where it gets really interesting, especially when we look back at the history of similar drugs that were developed for people. Okay. Like what kind of drugs are we talking about? So... In the human world, there were these drugs called, uh, let me get this right, anti-NGF monoclonal antibodies, or NGF-MABs, and they were being developed to treat chronic pain conditions. Okay, so they're like the human equivalent of Liberla. Yeah, kind of. But here's the catch. Uh-oh. During the clinical trials for these human anti-NGF drugs, some patients started experiencing this, like accelerated joint degeneration. Their joints were basically wiring down way faster than they should have been. Yikes. That sounds serious. It was. And it became a big enough problem that the FDA had to step in. They actually put some of the clinical trials on hold, and they even slapped these drugs with a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. Wow. A bro S. That's a pretty big deal. It is. It means the FDA was seriously concerned about the safety of these drugs. Okay, so the FDA puts the brakes on these human trials because of these joint problems. But what does that have to do with Liberla for dogs? Well, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? See, we know that NGF, nerve growth factor, it plays a crucial role in keeping our bones and cartilage healthy. Oh, okay. So if you block NGF, like these drugs do, there's this nagging worry that you might mess with the natural balance of things and potentially cause some unintended consequences, like joint problems. So the fact that these human anti-NGF drugs were causing joint damage in people, that raised some red flags about the potential for Librilla to do the same thing in dogs. Exactly. And that brings us to this new research paper. 
The researchers wanted to see if those concerns about Liberla were justified. Okay, so how did they go about investigating that? Well, they did it in a really smart way. Right. They combined like a two-pronged approach, right? Okay. So first, they had a team of specialists analyze all those adverse event reports from that UDRA Vigilance database. Yeah. Remember, that covers a huge amount of data, tons of reports from all over Europe. And then on top of that, they got an expert panel to review 19 specific cases where dogs had experienced, um, I guess you could say, pretty significant musculoskeletal issues after being given Librella. So they were looking for patterns in the big data and also digging deep into specific cases. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about the findings, the big reveals. What did they actually discover? So one of the most, um, I guess, eye-opening findings came from what they call a disproportionality analysis. Okay, disproportionality analysis. Yeah, it sounds complicated, but it's basically a way to compare how often certain adverse events are reported for one drug compared to other drugs that are used for the same condition. Right. So in this case, they looked at musculoskeletal adverse events, you know, problems with bones, joints, and stuff. Yeah. And they compared Librella to six other commonly used osteoarthritis drugs in dogs. And the results were pretty striking. Okay. Things like ligament and tendon injuries, polyarthritis, which is arthritis affecting multiple joints, fractures, even musculoskeletal neoplasia, that's like cancers of the bone or soft tissues, mm -hmm. And even septic arthritis, which is a really nasty joint infection. Mm. All those things were reported like nine times more frequently in dogs who were on Liberla compared to, get this, the total number of reports for all six of the other medications combined. Wait, nine times more frequently? Yeah. So not just a small difference, like a huge red flag. That's a really significant difference. And you mentioned they compared Liberilla to six other OA drugs. Wow. What were those other drugs, just so our listeners can get a sense of the comparison? Sure. So we're talking about some of the, like, household names in canine OA treatment, things like Rimadyl, Medicam, Prevacox, Onsir, Galaprant, and Daxacox. Yeah, those are the ones I always hear about. Yeah, exactly. The ones that vets have been prescribing for years. So to hear that Librella is associated with these musculoskeletal issues so much more often than all those other drugs combined, it's definitely a bit concerning. Yeah. And it really makes you question, you know, the whole safety profile of Liberla. Okay, so that's the disproportionality analysis. But they also looked at how those adverse event reports changed over time, right? They did, yeah. And that's where it gets even more, um, I guess, thought-provoking. What they found was that the number of these musculoskeletal adverse event reports for Liberla, it took only 45 months, so less than four years, to completely surpass the total number of those same kinds of reports for Rimadol, which was the leading comparator drug. Okay. And not only that, but it also went on to exceed the combined reports for all six comparator drugs over like a way longer period, 20 years. Wait, so in less than four years, Liberla racked up more musculoskeletal adverse event reports than Rimadol did in 20 years. Pretty much, yeah. And remember, Rimadol has been around for a long time and is used by a lot of dogs. Yeah, it's one of the most common of OA meds. That's a huge difference. So those are some pretty big numbers. They are. But it is important to keep in mind that these are based on reported events, and there are always factors that can affect how often people report things. Right. But still, the sheer difference in the numbers, it's hard to ignore. It is. So we've got the big data analysis, but then there's also the expert panel that reviewed those 19 individual cases, right? Yeah. That was a really important part of the study. So they had this panel of 18 experts, all big names in veterinary orthopedics, diagnostic imaging, and other relevant fields. And they each independently reviewed those 19 cases. 19 cases of dogs who had those musculoskeletal issues after being on Librella. That's right. And their conclusion was unanimous. Wow, unanimous. Yeah, they all agreed that there was a strong suspicion of a causal link between bidinvetmab, so Librella, and accelerated joint destruction in these dogs. So they were basically saying that Librella was likely the cause of these serious joint problems. What was it about those specific cases that led them to that conclusion? Well, the big thing was that the types of joint damage they saw in these dogs were just way beyond what you'd normally expect to see with typical osteoarthritis. Oh, okay. We're talking about things like pathological fractures. That's where a bone breaks, even though there was no obvious injury, like a fall or something. Wow. And also really severe joint damage happening really quickly in joints that were either only mildly affected by OA before or were actually completely normal. So not just the arthritis getting a bit worse, but like brand new problems popping up. Exactly. It was like the Liberla was somehow accelerating 
the joint breakdown. And this study goes into some details about those individual cases, and some of them are, um, well, they're pretty alarming. Yeah. Give us some examples. So the elbow was the joint that was most often affected in these cases. Okay. And they saw those pathological fractures we talked about and also joint luxations, which is where the bones in the joint literally come apart. Ouch. Oh, that sounds incredibly painful. It is, yeah. And there were some cases that were especially interesting, like some dogs who had OA in their elbows. But then after starting Liberola, they developed really bad destructive changes in their hock joints, their ankles, basically. And those hock joints had been perfectly healthy before. So the joint problems weren't just limited to the areas where they already had arthritis. Nope. Maybe. It seemed like the Liberola could be affecting joints all over the body. And in some of those cases, they actually took tissue samples from the affected joints and looked at them under a microscope. That's called histopathology, right? Yeah, that's it. And what they saw in those samples was really similar to what's been described as rapidly progressive osteoarthritis in humans who were given those anti-NGF drugs we talked about earlier. So it's like those same patterns of joint damage that were seen in the human trials were showing up in these dogs as well. Exactly. And it's a pretty strong suggestion that those concerns about Liberola might be more than just theoretical. Yeah. So not only did they find a higher rate of these musculoskeletal issues with Liberola, but the type of damage also seems to match up with what was seen in humans. That's a pretty strong case. It is. But there's another layer to this whole story. Okay. And it has to do with how those adverse events were reported in the first place. Oh, you mean like maybe there were problems with how the data was collected or something? Yeah, no. kind of. The researchers actually found some pretty significant inconsistencies, what they call translation errors, in over half of those 19 cases they reviewed. Translation errors? What does that mean? It means that what the vets who actually treated the dogs initially reported was different from what ended up being filed by Zoetis. Zoetis, the company that makes Liberla. Yeah. And these weren't just minor differences. Okay. Like, what kind of discrepancies were they seeing? Well, there were variations in the diagnosis, how severe the adverse event was, and even the outcome for the dog. Yeah, so for example, there were cases that the vet had marked down as like serious adverse reactions, but when Zoetis reported them, they were listed as not serious. Wow. And even more concerning was that some cases were reported as overdoses by Zoetis, but when the researchers looked at the actual dosage the dog had received, it was right in the middle of the recommended range. So it wasn't actually an overdose at all? Nope. Hmm. That's a bit worrying. It is, because if the information that ends up in the hands of the regulatory agencies isn't accurate, it can really skew our understanding of how common and how severe these problems actually are. Right. It's like trying to solve a puzzle with the wrong pieces. Exactly. So it really raises questions about the accuracy of the entire adverse event reporting system. Yeah, it definitely makes you wonder about the bigger picture. It does. And going back to how Liberola actually works, the researchers also point out that those musculoskeletal issues might be linked to the fact that it blocks nerve growth factor. Right. Right? Yeah, they do. Because remember, NGF is really important for keeping those bones and cartilage healthy. So if you're constantly blocking its action, it's not surprising that you might end up with some joint problems down the line. And this really echoes those concerns that were raised during the human trials of those similar anti-NGF drugs. It's like we're seeing that same story play out again, but this time in dogs. It is. And speaking of those human trials, you mentioned earlier that they had some pretty strict monitoring in place. How did the pre-market trials for Labrella compare? Yeah, that's a really important point. So in those human trials, they were really proactive about looking for signs of joint degeneration. They did extensive x-rays and imaging on all the participants, specifically to see if those drugs were causing any problems. But with Liberella, it wasn't quite the same story. Yeah, the pre-market trials for Liberella, they only involved a pretty small number of dogs who got more than three doses. And here's the kicker. They didn't have those same detailed radiographic screening protocols to look for those specific joint changes. So basically, they weren't actively looking for the same types of problems that they were worried about in the human trials. Right. They weren't specifically looking for signs of rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. And that's important because they might have missed some early warning signs. Exactly. And that's something the researchers emphasize in the paper. They really want to make it clear that they don't think these severe cases are just isolated incidents. Okay. They use a really helpful analogy with NSAIs. You know how NSAIs can cause stomach ulcers? Right. Well, they say 
that if we only focused on the worst case scenario, like those really bad ulcers that can be life-threatening, and compared that to the total number of NSAI doses that are given out every year, we would completely underestimate how much trouble those drugs can cause in the gut. Yeah. Because it's not just about the really bad ulcers. It's about all the other stomach upset and problems that NSAIDs can cause, which might be more common, but are still a big deal for those dogs. Right. So it's about looking at the whole picture, not just the most extreme cases. So in this case, it's not just about those 19 really bad cases. It's about all those other musculoskeletal events that are being reported with Liberola, even if they're not quite as severe. Yeah. It suggests that there might be a much bigger problem lurking beneath the surface. And the researchers also talk about some limitations with the current system for tracking drug safety in animals. They do. And one of the big ones is that the official reporting system, it doesn't even have a specific term for rapidly progressive osteoarthritis, oh. or RPOA. So they can't even properly label it. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. And it means that these really serious cases, they might end up being lumped in with more general terms like arthritis or lameness, which makes it really hard to track the true incidence of this specific problem. That's a huge problem. It's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. It is. And to their credit, the researchers have actually formally requested that RPOA be added to the official terminology. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So hopefully that'll improve things in the future. So at the end of the day, what do the researchers conclude? Well, they basically say that their research backs up what the FDA and other regulatory bodies have been saying that there are some real safety concerns with Labrella, especially when it comes to these musculoskeletal events. Okay. And they really emphasize that we need more research, more studies, and way closer monitoring of dogs who are on Labrella so we can really understand the risks. So it sounds like this paper is a pretty big deal. It is. It's like a wake-up call. Yeah. It tells us that we need to be really cautious about Labrella mm -hmm. and that we can't just assume that it's completely safe just because it's new and it's popular. So to wrap things up, what are the absolute key takeaways from this deep dive? What do our listeners need to remember? I think the big things are, first, this research found way more musculoskeletal problems in dogs taken Liberla compared to those other OA drugs. Yeah. Not as more problems, but more serious problems too. And that expert panel, all 18 of them, agreeing that liberal was likely causing accelerated joint destruction in some cases, that's a big deal. Yeah, that's pretty definitive. It is. And then there's the whole issue of how accurately those adverse events are being reported, which, you know, that adds another layer of concern. Yeah, for sure. And the fact that those joint problems might be directly related to how Liberla actually works by blocking NGF, that's a big clue. It is. And finally, the fact that the pre-market trials for Liberla didn't have the same level of screening for joint problems as those human drugs did, that raises some questions about whether they missed something important. Yeah. It's like they weren't looking for the same types of problems, so they might not have seen them, even if they were there. Right. Okay. So while Liberla might help a lot of dogs, this research is definitely raising some red flags about its potential risks. Yeah, it's all about weighing those benefits against the risks and working closely with your vet to make the best decisions for your dog. Absolutely. Well, this has been um, a very informative and maybe even a little bit unsettling deep dive. It has. It's given us a lot to think about when it comes to taking care of our furry friends and managing their osteoarthritis. Right. Because even though new treatments like Liberla come out all the time, it's so important to keep asking questions, keep learning, and keep advocating for our dogs. Couldn't have said it better myself. And that brings us to our final thought for today. We talked about the parallels between these human and animal drugs that target NGF and the importance of really scrutinizing new treatments. So we want to leave you with this. What does this research tell us about the bigger picture, about how we evaluate new drugs in veterinary medicine and make sure they're truly safe and effective for our pets? Yeah, it's a good question. What questions should you be asking your vet? What kind of research and information should we all be looking for to make sure we're making the best possible choices for our furry companions? Because at the end of the day, it's about their well-being and their long-term health. And as we always say, knowledge is power. And when it comes to our dogs, we want all the power we can get. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive. It's been a really important one.